Hi, welcome to another episode of Scorpio Season. Um, we're here today with your hosts, Lisa and Venkat. Hey, Venkat, how's it going? Hey, Lisa. So uh, we are in to the third week of January and mm -hmm. inauguration is a couple of days from now. So it's one of those historic weeks and we are on the letter K, right? So what are we talking about right. for K? Uh, our, our topic for K is killings, right? Killing. The week of death. Um, so, I mean, clearly, obviously, there's the death of the Trump administration, if you could call it that, the end end of an era. Um, Has it been killed, though? In fact, it seems like the opposite of killed, like it's not going away gracefully. <laughs> it's like, like, you know, those horror movies where like in five minutes before the end, it looks like the monster has been killed. And then the, I don't know, heroes are, and heroines are like celebrating and about to party, then the monster comes back. Yeah. But I feel bad about like calling the Trump administration monstrous, even though like, like a third of the country still supports him or whatever. But yeah, I, I don't think, um, yeah, okay. I don't mind drawing the comparison to a horror movie ending. But yeah, so that's something that's not going away gracefully. So that's one kind of killing. Yeah. What is happening? Um. What else is happening? Well, you were saying that um, you had some news about you live in LA, right? Oh yeah, so uh, this morning there was a press release from the LA County or Southern California Coast uh, Pollution Monitoring Agency. So the one that monitors the pollution levels and they just loosened air quality standards because there's so many backlog, there's such a big backlog of bodies, uh, people dying from COVID that they have to lift the limits on how many cremations the crematoriums can do per day. And doing that increases the air pollution. So basically we have to loosen air pollution restrictions simply so we can burn more bodies. I think there's like 2,700 bodies uh, sitting around in various like freezers and cold storages just waiting for cremations. So yeah, that's COVID is a major killing spree that's affecting air pollution. That's incredible. Wasn't there back last year, I guess it was a year ago now, more or less, um, at the same, at this time in Wuhan, I thought there were people that were spotting a lot of, um, a lot of pollution emissions coming out of Wuhan in China. And it was speculated that it was exactly from this, from the crematories huh, burning bodies. There was? Okay, so, so that's an interesting way to cross check the numbers, right? Because uh, nobody believes the official statistics, but then you have to ask like, to what extent don't you believe them? Like they claimed it was what, a few thousands or do you believe it was off by 10% or off by 10X, right? Yeah. Actually, do you believe like the first wave in China, do you believe it was like accurate off by 10% or off by 10X? I don't remember exactly what numbers they reported. I um, think they eventually copped to about 4,000. So initially they were claiming like less than 2,000 or something and then it ended up as 4,000. They doubled their number. Oh, okay, so this is a good question. How So how big is Wuhan compared to LA? Let's Google that. Uh, <laughs> uh, I like that we're Google. like, we're Googling the kill counts. Um, yeah, we're Googling a kill count. Um, so Wuhan claims to have had 3,869 deaths. Or wait, mm -hmm. so that's Wuhan. And then Hubei province overall is 4512. And okay. it had 50,000 cases. And let's look at Wuhan population. Okay. So it's about a 10% fall off. So 11 million. So it's about actually the size of uh, the greater LA metro area. So mm -hmm. LA city proper, I think it's 4 million or something. And then the county might be around 10, 11 million. So I would say the comparable size actually. Uh, so LA alone, let's see how many it had, deaths it has had. I'm Googling as we speak. It's amazing that we can do this. Uh, yeah, that is cool. So 13,848 deaths. So it's 3X uh, so far. 13,000 over how long? Over 13, a... over since it started, I guess. And California has 33,000 of which 13,000 are uh, Los Angeles. Right, like, China overall, I think is uh, basically the same as uh, Wuhan and uh, Hubei because they claim they contained it entirely there. So I'm going to just Google that for comparison. 
So we have, huh? Yeah, it's I think less than five thousand total. Like it's um, they have they don't have the full. Okay, so the U.S. Nice. is getting close to half a million, and mm -hmm. California is thirty three thousand, LA is thirteen thousand, and all of China claims to be under five thousand, and I think. Um, the key to believing it is that that's how exponential growth works. Like if you contain exponential growth early on, it will look that ridiculously off. But on the other hand, nobody believes China numbers. So I, I, I don't know. I, I think they're not lying because it's hard to hide that much. Um, and but, but the pollution and other sort of things suggest that it's probably not 4,000. So I, I would guess maybe off by two. Like maybe oh, they're claiming like 10,000 deaths are like 4,000, but I don't think it's like, you know, hundreds of thousands that they're pretending is just a few thousands. Yeah, I think you're right about that. And even seeing the like mortality rate here in the States hasn't been hundreds of thousands, right? I mean, we've basically let it run unimpeded mostly and we haven't seen like- No, like, the US is now almost at 400,000. People who've died or people yeah. who have gotten it? Far yeah, and then by February, died. they're projecting it'll be half a million. Mm, okay. So, As, well, okay. Half a million people, but that is over the course of a year, right? Whereas in yeah. Wuhan, it, But per capita, down. yeah, it's a 399K right now. And it's the funny thing is the US is 4% of the world's population, but about 25% of the documented COVID deaths. So it's like mm. disproportionately high in that sense. And I think that's partly because the response has been poor, partly because it's an aging population with lots of old obese people in you know, nursing homes and stuff. Yep. But yeah, so that's killing as in COVID killing people. Yeah, that's crazy. <sighs> killing yeah. is a gloomy I mean, topic. Huh? Killing is <laughs> yes, a I love topic. it. It's a great gloomy topic. Uh -huh. Love gloomy topic. I don't know. I'm curious to see what happens here in Houston. Um, the number of people going out to bars and stuff seems like it's picking back up. I mean, you see people waiting outside wearing masks and such, but people here are done with it. They're ready to be on. Let's kill COVID and move on to the next thing. Um, yeah. And that's what I'm hearing from India as well. Like India has a lot higher mask compliance than the US. There isn't like an anti-masking faction going on. But people have basically said, all right, we'll wear masks, but otherwise we're just going about our lives as usual. But then it's a much younger country. I think median age is like 20, 25 years lower. So the mortality rate is much lower because of that. And speaking of killing things, just occurred to me that another thing that got killed was actually a thing with a K, the Keystone Pipeline. So oh. yeah, Biden announced that on day one when he takes office, He's going to kill the Keystone Pipeline. Which one is the Keystone Pipeline? That's the one coming from Canada through North Dakota and the oh. one that all the uh, far left uh, and Native Americans have been protesting. They've been like, yeah. it, it, it goes through, I think, Native American lands as well as some like natural forest or something. Mm -hmm. So it's quite controversial and they've been protesting it for like years. Right. Like, uh, yeah. yeah. And it wasn't there. They were protesting it because they're worried about the environmental damage from leaks from the pipeline, et cetera. Environmental right? damage, Native American land rights. It's, it's one of those things where um, the, the left right now is very much a big tent kind of political thing where it's like, if it's about one thing, it's about everything. So if it's about the environment and climate, they'll add you know, gender rights, Native American rights, gay rights, like they throw everything into every issue. So that's why it's hard to sort of be narrow. And uh, I'm, I'm a sort of, um, I haven't looked into the issue, but my default is since I'm like strong climate uh, hawk, I'm sort of against it on the basis of just climate. Like you shouldn't be building more fossil fuel infrastructure. That's sort of a basic default for me. But for other stuff, I don't know. But isn't it, um, isn't the whole oil thing kind of a geopolitical thing? issue like us being able to get um the the point of building the pipeline i don't know exactly where it was going but i would assume that it's probably headed to the refineries on the gulf coast or i actually don't it goes all the way well it's natural gas where does the keystone pipeline we are doing a lot of googling today we are not really wait no that's a, 
But so wait, so the Keystone Pipeline was natural gas, not oil? Uh, I thought it was oil. Keystone Pipeline da, 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 owned by TC Energy. It runs from the Western Canadian sedimentary basin to uh, refineries in Illinois and Texas. Yeah. Yeah. So it comes yeah. down to refineries in, in your neck of the woods. Yep. Uh, yeah. But uh, here's the thing. Yeah, it's it's part of like geopolitics and oil security and stuff. But it's it's a game where Russia and Saudi Arabia are just allowing the U.S. sort of room to play, right? Because they have like such powerful knobs. If they want, they can like crash the oil prices to the point that U.S. gas and oil becomes like totally uncompetitive overnight. And the that's actually something I think the U.S. and uh, sorry, Russia and Saudi Arabia fight over a lot because both of them realized that they could shut down the U.S. Um, uh, industry in terms of price support overnight if they wanted to, but they're like indulging the U.S. because they get other favors in return, like you know the U.S. stays out of the Middle East kind of shit. Is that I don't know if that's true. My understanding is that like part of the reason the oil prices went negative when the pandemic hit is that Russia was in the period of like overproducing and so they're already trying to dampen down the prices. So like the supply just got completely huge. Yep. Um, and the way, so my dad works in the oil industry. I don't know how true this is, but his understanding of the geopolitical stuff around um, oil is that the Russians are trying to bankrupt all of the frackers in America. Yeah. So they do it based on bankruptcy of these private firms um, that take out, you know, they take out loans to drill oil wells. And then because the price of the oil can't support their um, project, then they end up having to go bankrupt. And then if you bankrupt enough companies, the idea being if you bankrupt enough companies, then the oil production in the US will fall off, um, which is kind of interesting because I believe that in Russia and in Saudi Arabia, both of those are national kind of like government sponsored projects, right? So they don't, they're not really subject to the same level of, um, the same level of very, or like exposure to market um, dynamics in the same way that these capital funded projects are, or I don't know, the oil industry is so heavily regulated and supported with all sorts of like random subsidies in different ways that uh, it's it's hard to like, even though it's not a nationalized industry in the US like it is in Russia or Saudi Arabia, it's still not like a free market. Like um, the, there's too many controls over it to call it that. But yeah, I think I basically agree with uh, your what your dad um, said. And it's a question of like, how hard is Russia turning the screws? And I think the point, that Russia and Saudi Arabia fight over is how much should they turn the screws and how big should they allow the US industry to get or like, you know, shrink it down or something. And because, I mean, it's not that the US doesn't have any sort of levers it can push on its own, right? It's got like military presence in the Middle East. It has its own things. It can, you can, it can do embargoes. The Saudi Arabia depends on the US for so many things. I mean, so, we've got a big embargo going on now against Venezuela and Iran. Um, yep. I think the weird thing about, I think they also have one against North Korea, but the North Korea one is weird because North Korea and Crimea, Crimea, um, but the North Korea Crimea ones are weird because they're not oil producing the same way that Venezuela and Iran are. Um, I don't know. Yeah, they're for different reasons, but you're right. The embargoes are actually an interesting lever that the US has because if they wanted to like hurt Russia and Saudi Arabia, they could just like remove the embargoes and then suddenly more oil would flood the market, right? So it's it's not like um, they don't have right. power. So to some extent, you kind of wonder how much those embargoes are as a favor to either and or Russia or Saudi Arabia, right? Like there's a, clearly a lot going on here. Um, yeah. In a way, there's like three levels of killing going on. Like the world overall is trying to kill fossil fuels. Within mm -hmm. the fossil fuel industry, the remaining players are trying to like capture the rest of the market by killing the other players. Yeah. And then at the lowest level, we have things like the Keystone pipeline getting killed, right? So it's okay. like, yeah, lots of killing stacks and stacks isn't of killing. This, isn't this where, you know, you, the um, the supremely arrogant Bitcoiner like flies in and is like, Bitcoin fixes this because you can monetize stranded energy. So killing the Keystone pipeline is actually a, probably, God, I hate to say this, but maybe a great boon to... Um, stranded stranded energy um or i don't know what the current plan is for getting the oil or energy out of that part of canada without the pipeline 
but if you're a Bitcoin miner, the idea is you fly in some Bitcoin miners and plug them into the energy source and then yep. just burn the energy and make more Bitcoin. Um, or so for Bitcoin. that, that's like the side flaring stuff, right? Like Crusoe Energy, yeah. Yeah, I'm familiar with that company. So their idea is you're pumping oil and then the gas that you would otherwise flare mm -hmm. off, you burn and mine Bitcoin. But if well, you're you not pump, it. you put it into oh. a generator that that powers Bitcoin. Yeah. Yeah, but if you're not pumping the oil at all, there is no sort of um, effluent gases that you have to flare off. So you just cap the oil well altogether. But I think mm -hmm. Canada's alternate path would be pressurized LNG containers that go to the coast and get shipped into LNG tankers. Mm -hmm. uh, it wouldn't be a pipeline. Uh, but that's much more expensive infrastructure and probably it would only be supported at a higher price for gas. Interesting. Yeah, I see. Okay. Mm -hmm. There is a book I like to recommend. Like it's um, Daniel Yergin, The Prize. And then he wrote another book called The Quest. Amazing books uh, about the oil industry and uh, just how, how much on a razor's edge this stuff is balanced. Like people build these huge billion dollar refineries and then the price moves a little bit. And then it's like, stranded capital assets, as in the equipment is worthless now, or like huge ship and uh, ships and tankers. You know, that is very similar to, I feel like what is going on in Bitcoin mining, mining <laughs> industry right now, because a lot of it is, well, if the price moves against us, all of this mining machine capital that we've just invested in or bought for thousands of dollars, millions of dollars even is completely worthless and it's not worth running it. Like burning that electricity is like, you can't, re there's no return on that at all. It's like actually <laughs> negative. Um, so I think that what's interesting is once your um, power costs go to zero, then, so if your power cost is zero, then your, there is no reason not to run the machines because even if their return is so tiny, your cost is basically zero at that point. So the, at some point in the future, you might make your capital back. Um, yep. So your energy cost is like a huge input into the, is this, is running this finding machine worth it? Um, as it's like so, the, so the interesting thing there is how do you even calculate this? Because the net present value of something like Bitcoin, especially forget Ethereum and the others, but Bitcoin, <laughs> since we know it's uh, sort of depreciating, uh, not depreciating, what do you call it? Uh, deflationary asset with a cap. And we know it has this sort of um, trajectory where I just read this analysis, I think by Pantera Capital's uh, newsletter, which says that every time a halvening happens, it seems that the lag is about like a year or so when the price bump happens. So the halvening was last May and about 11 months later, right on schedule with their prediction, it went up from, you know, whatever, 14 to nearly 40, right? So if you are a miner and even if it's not paying back or recovering its energy cost right now, but you right. do the calculation over the expected horizon, it will be like, yeah, this will be worth something in the future, right? Right. Uh, right. So at that point, it's do you have the money, do you have the capital right now to continue paying your energy prices, your energy yeah. bill? So uh, it's a real. It's a tough calculation. So you you're betting against sort of the future of Bitcoin getting regulated out of existence rather mm -hmm. than the That's price. True. Well, there's Bitcoin. also there's also so the Bitcoin price has to go up faster than the competition to mine the Bitcoin. So as long as the market to bring more machines online or more efficient machines online is constrained, then your calculation, well, I guess as long as you're making Bitcoin in the present is fine, but your your calculation of how of the value of your mining machine and like present US dollars is also like if you do the net present value of a mining machine, it's really hard to calculate because you don't know what the uh, um, difficulty level is going to be so there's so it's like you have to project future. both the hash power of the future as well as uh, the cop price of bitcoin and it's like what's your fraction of the world's mining hash power and if that's dropping faster than the price of bitcoin okay i get your point okay yeah that's that's interesting huh. yeah yeah so it's like actually kind of i think a little bit of a shit show to be a, mi a bitcoin miner but it does really feel a lot like this um oil industry in terms of you do the big capital investment into the refinery and then the wrong thing moves the wrong way and you've got a lot Except of Except it's in reverse, like uh, fossil fuels right now are in like shrinkage mode. Like uh, you're, people are definitely not building coal fired plants anymore. So coal is basically on its deathbed. Um, heavy oils and light oils and uh, gases. It's like all of them are like a shrinking market. So it's like 
you want to grab as much of the remaining market as possible, but you don't want to build new infrastructure to get it. So mm -hmm. it's, it's a harvesting mar market, basically. You're harvesting whatever's left. So that's going to be interesting. So harvesting is a type of slow killing. It's like- Yeah, it is. Which way are you? How is this death playing out, the kill or whatever? Do you kill your project now and just kind of call it a sunk cost and say, okay, that's, that's it? Or it's interesting. Yeah. I sort of wonder that, so my worry with things like coal, the demand for coal going away, but coal still existing is that someone will figure out how to hook up Bitcoin machines to it and do the calculation that burning the coal for mining Bitcoin is actually a better return on investment than whatever coal burning it for whatever we were using it for heavy industry. Um, so that because there's like all this, this coal will suddenly become like classified as a stranded energy source and Bitcoiners will move in. And I mean, that takes capital too. Um, a lot of that kind of depends on efficiency yeah. of building the stuff and whatnot. But this is my worry with like Iran turning into a big Bitcoin miner too. So talking, we talked earlier about the embargo or the, yeah, embargo is the right word, whatever. Yeah, it's like a financial yeah. embargo. Um, you're not allowed to trade with Iran if you're an American um, or an American business. Like even GitHub shut down their, GitHub had it such that if you were an Iran, if they thought you were, if you were an Iranian developer, you couldn't use their services because the way that the legislation is written is such that any American firm is not allowed to provide services to Iranian nationals. Um, anyways, like, so the, where was I going? Oh, so Iran has started using Bitcoin for international payments for trade because they can't use US dollars because that's really locked down and there's a lot of- um, Wait, they've started doing a lot of people paying attention Bitcoin to, for international payments? Huh? Have started? Have people started using Bitcoin? No, for Iran in particular. Has Iran started using? Bitcoin? My understanding is that some international trade with Iranians is done using Bitcoin. Oh, um, wow. Okay, I've not I would, heard that. Interesting. I saw someone on Twitter the other day that was talking about how they usually buy medical supplies. Something, some guy usually buys some sort of supplies from India, and the guy who like supplier in India, I don't know what kind of thing, but you know, just like a widget, a widget supplier who was based in India was asking the guy to pay him in Bitcoin because it's much easier to receive Bitcoin payments than it is to make a wire transfer internationally. Mm -hmm. um, the software, like the availability of Bitcoin software just to receive money is like really low barrier to entry and pretty, very, very cheap compared to existing wire yeah. services. Um, yeah, uh, so I think international trade is kind of moving toward, Bitcoin's just so much easier than existing bank transfers. like. I had to make a payment to someone the other day for a large amount of money um, and I just sent them Bitcoin. I didn't have to do a wire or anything. Like, hmm. yeah, yes, um, it's interesting like what is worth doing when the way to like the, the connecting the dots from doing something and making money off it becomes as short as if you can burn something to get Bitcoin. That's like the, one of the shortest supply chains between a capital asset and uh, <laughs> A, a return and a yeah talk about passive income too you just plug the machine in and walk away um here's an example that you like like forget uh, fossil fuels which are like you know dead old marine animals in the ground from like millions of years ago mm -hmm. think about things buried much more recently namely garbage dumps so just learned about this case where some guy uh, apparently had like 70 million worth of bitcoin on a hard drive that he um accidentally threw away and he's offering the city money to dig up its garbage dump to find it and he's offering them a fraction of it. So, um, so the city has so far refused like saying it'll cost millions to hunt through. But at what point this, does this become like sunken treasure in like a Spanish galleon or something? And it's like, if it's worth several billion, somebody's going to dig up that <laughs> garbage uh, mountain, right? Definitely. I think we're safely into sunken treasure territory now. I mean, this is equivalent to hearing the Spanish galleon went down like off 50 miles off the coast of Cuba, right? Um, <laughs> like, I think my understanding is the case that you're talking about, the guy with the, he threw it away into a city plot or a city dumpster. I think it's in the UK and the, the county government doesn't want to allow him permission to dig through it. He actually, I believe he found a hedge fund or hedge fund found him. Um, I got this from Matt Levine's uh, The Money Stuff. Money Stuff newsletter. Yeah, I subscribed to it. Probably you also heard about yeah. it. Yeah. 
Yeah. Anyways, but to go back to Iran, I am sort of worried that it's all, I think there was a news lately, there's, so there are two pieces of news around Bitcoin and government mining. Uh, one is that Iran recently confiscated a lot of miner. Um, so one thing you may not know is that there's currently a huge shortage of mining machines. And it actually goes all the way back to the foundries because the chips aren't coming out fast mm -hmm. enough. Um, so there's a big just computer chip to slow down, which I'm sure is attributable to COVID, like 100% convinced that that is a COVID related delay. Um, but anyways, so recent news is that Iran recently confiscated a bunch of miners from from local, from Iranian miners that they claim were mining illegally. And part of me is like, how illegal? Like, I mean, they, they put a lot of like restrictions in place that basically meant that the government had to get a pretty big cut of what the miners were doing. So they added restrictions on top of what the miners were doing. And then eventually, you know, the miners went around them. And then now the government's, well, we put these really onerous burdens on your ability to mine Bitcoin, which to be fair, I guess it's pretty like state subsidized power. So, okay, who's exactly right here? But um, now the, the government has decided that these miners are out of, Bounds, so they went and took the miners. So I am 100% certain that Iran was, is if they're not already, will be using those miners to mine currency for the state. Um, yeah, and this is like standard autocratic government uh, move where you like give enough room for the private industry to thrive, but not so much that you can't reel them in the moment it becomes advantageous. I mean, that's kind of how post-Soviet Russia's oligarchs uh, uh, existed like on the surface it looked like they were suddenly making billions off of like you know ex-soviet economic opportunity mm -hmm. but in reality they were not like you know jeff bezos or like billionaires in the west they were always completely under the thumb of the government and the moment the government wanted it could like throw people in jail take all their assets like that's kind of happening did you follow the jack ma story like um, did he come yeah. back to life i don't i haven't heard anything oh, well. Let he hadn't been seen to, since October, uh, right? In public was the thing. Huh? Speaking of kills. <laughs> yeah, so I don't know if he's come back into public life or not. Uh, oh, didn't he like send an email and people were like, oh, he's fine. No, I'm kidding. I don't know. Um, yeah, I don't think he's back yet. I don't think he's uh, back. Huh. But they've, they've, they've taken work to kind of start breaking the anchor. Yeah, so this is like the Soviet Union again. Mm, interesting. Being an oligarch. Yeah. Totally unrelated to oligarchs and autocracies, but Pakistan has also started mining Bitcoin. So Iran's right next to Pakistan. I mean, I think it's illegal in India right now, but it's it's now such a commodity that basically anybody can get around it. But if a country really wants to like shut it down, they would like do it at the national level, like uh, firewall off um, connections to like the Bitcoin network, right? So you wouldn't be able to get your transactions verified or something is would that be possible like could you do a national level firewall where you make it a bitcoin island basically mm, yeah i think you could try you could try really hard um i think you could probably do some amount of port blocking but you could always change what port your stuff works on um the mm, I don't know a lot about how the peer-to-peer -peer, like finding and stuff works i know that they did a lot of um, I know that a lot of work has been done to make sure that you can't get, your node can't get attacked very easily. So you couldn't get partitioned. Someone couldn't set up other peers around your node such that you think that you've got all the right information, but they're actually feeding you false info. Um, so there's been a lot of work to prevent that kind of attack. Um, the Blockstream company I work for has a satellite service, which they yep. use to keep, the idea is to keep, um, splits from happening. So if the, Russia, for example, shut their internet. Russia a while ago, I want to say like six to eight months ago, did a like game day where they turned their internet off. Speaking of kills, um, they, like, uh, they, they turned off their internet for a day or something. Like it's just like the whole, they disconnected everything from external sources and it was just internal. Um, and I don't know exactly if our satellite service was working over that region yet, because we kind of rolled out like waves, parts of the world in kind of waves. Um, but there was, it was like, it was kind of like, oh, this might be a good opportunity to test this theory that having the satellite will keep the Bitcoin network from getting to um, split, like getting split heads. So did that work? Did the satellite save the day? I don't know if it did. I don't think we had, I don't think we had the... Um, infrastructure in place to test this theory okay 
<laughs> but that's, I, I guess, a good sort of um, big question to end today's episode on. Is mm -hmm. Bitcoin killable? Like, in theory, like, what would it take to kill Bitcoin? It's decentralized, even if the network fragments, it's like it can sort of like use satellites and stuff to stay connected and sort of in consensus. Like, is Bitcoin unkillable? So long as two people somewhere in the world are mining and like communicating transactions to each other. I mean, it's kind of, I feel like you could kind of draw a semi-analogous uh, parallel to is the internet killable and that they're both decentralized services. Um, I think that there's probably a way to take the internet down, but it would take a lot of work and energy. Um, I think Bitcoin has kind of reached the same point where you could kill it, but it would take a lot of kind of rooting out the ground gorilla movement sort of. Um, so I can think of a few, cause like there's people like me who run Bitcoin nodes at home, right? Um, and I assume there's like thousands of people all over the world that are doing this. Um, I think like America kind of has a short sight on Bitcoin is that how international, like Bitcoin is truly international. And I don't think that people in the US really understand this because we're not really good at understanding international things. I think I know why that is. It's because the US dollar is the sort of um, reserve currency. So when you're on the top of the currency heap, it's hard to see the challenger coming up and nipping at your heels. Like Britain was the same way between the two world wars. Like uh, the Great Britain pound was the sort of dominant currency at the beginning of World War One, And by the end of World War Two, the US dollar had become the dominant currency. And in between there was like all these um, effectively national denial moments of like the pound is not as strong as we thought it was. And eventually, you know, several conferences and agreements later, the pound became like kind of like a shadow of its former self. And I think the US dollar might be the similar kind of blinding effect for Bitcoin. Huh. So the US dollar is dying, I think, but not in our lifetime, but something it's, it's in bad shape. I think this decade is going to be an interesting decade for the US dollar. Yep, we'll see if it dies. Because we've got what, two more, we've got two, two and a half presidencies, so to speak, um, to go. Uh, one of which is a Democrat. Maybe the next one will be some non-denominational party, who knows? Um, you said you're getting certified to be a broker or something, right? You're getting some sort of license for that? I am. I'm studying for my Series 65, which means that I am eligible to be a registered investment advisor. So, so are you? Does your sort of certification material involve like bond trading and stuff? So, yeah. at some point in the future, we should uh, talk about like bond yield curves, inverting, and all that stuff that people are talking about. Because yeah. I don't understand that stuff, but it seems to have implications for what's happening to the dollar, right? So. Yeah, I actually, that's not something that these textbooks really cover. Um, I learned a lot more about annuities and life insurance oh, and uh, all and the, the scammy plan. stuff that you're going to try and sell people. Yeah, except that I can only sell, well, I can't sell really any of it because I'm not, I won't be licensed to, well, anyways, yeah, <laughs> exactly. <laughs> Getting my post Bitcoin scam plans in place. Um, <laughs> I'm sorry, but to get sometimes if I take a carefully edited version of the things you do, you could be portrayed as a very scammy, grifty person. Like I expect you to start selling vitamins and multi-level marketing schemes yeah. any moment. I'm like pretty... pop out, like, you know, some like thing, like, da -da. <laughs> we should make up an MLM scheme to sell people. Okay. Yeah, let's do it. I'm on board. Should we, we could launch a coin for it. We'll call it an ICO. Is that exactly All right. I don't know. I think that's a good note to end on. Bitcoin <laughs> and scams and stuff at the end of the world. Yeah. Killing the world by scam. Sounds great. Well, Venkat, uh, it's always a pleasure. Uh, I look forward to talking to you next week. All right. Next week, IJKL. So next time is L. So oh, L. we can talk about Lightning Network, maybe. Let's do it. All, All right. right. Bye. Bye. Scorpio Season is proud to be sponsored by uh, Smoke and Screws, the premium filter for your glass pipes, water pipes, and one hitters. Check out their next generation screen technology at smokeandscrews.com. Uh, we're also proud to be sponsored by Art of the Gig, 
a subscriber-only newsletter for freelancers and independent consultants. Learn more about how to take your consulting practice to the next level at artofgig.com. Uh, great. Um, and if you liked our show, don't forget to like and subscribe.